Oh well, yeah, thanks for taking time out of uh, Saturday to uh, to come here. It's it's great to be here. Um, this is actually my first time in Edinburgh, um, and it is quite nice. I like it. Um, <laughs> So when I was uh, small, I, I, uh, so I'm half Icelandic, half Irish, and my parents decided that I, we should live in England. So we lived in uh, kind of halfway between Liverpool and Manchester. And whenever we would go to Iceland, we'd always have to drive up to Glasgow because that was the closest flight. So in my youth, Glas uh, Scotland was this place that I unfortunately had to sit in a car for many hours to get to in order to get to Iceland. Um, so, you know, the, my first uh, memories of Scotland were not entirely pleasant. But um, what I'm going to try and do tonight is I'm going to um, tell you a fairly long and fairly boring story, hopefully in a fairly short and slightly entertaining way, about um, the experience that we had with the Icelandic uh, constitutional process. And I'm going to preface that with a little bit of history about uh, how Iceland got to where it is today and then try and put that into some perspective of you know, um, uh, my entirely erroneous view of where Scotland is and, and uh, you know, uh, because I've been trying to follow the Scottish independence debate and you know, I'm, I'm quite interested in independence movements in general. Um, but on the other hand, you, you might have noticed that the media are not entirely um, working uh, to the benefit of the Yes campaign. So all of the information I get is somewhat skewed. Um, so, you know, but hopefully my views aren't entirely wrong on the subject. But um, I'm going to start with um, the Dog Days King. So this guy uh, is called Jörn Jönsson, um, uh, which in Icelandic we say Jörn uh, Um He was a Danish sailor uh, in the early 19th century who uh, amongst other things, made the first map of Sydney Bay um, in Australia uh, when he was there in prison. And then later he went to Portsmouth and, and met uh, some, uh, some English guys who were on a, uh, planning a trip to Iceland. And because he spoke Danish and Iceland was a Danish colony at the time, he, he enlisted as their translator. So um, in early 1809, they get to Iceland and uh, on the ship, the Mary and Anne, and the first thing that happens is that the governor general uh, of Iceland, who is this Danish count, uh, basically says, no, actually, you know, Denmark is at war with Britain, so therefore, you know, we're not going to allow you to trade. And while the British ship was, you know, with uh, this soap maker Samuel Phelps and various others, were trying to figure out what to do about this, this guy just kind of went onto the mainland and made a citizen's arrest of Count Trump. Uh, and uh, essentially uh, performed a, a coup d'etat, uh, uh, um, uh, which lasted for uh, the summer months of 1809. And so he's referred to in Iceland as the Dog Days King uh, for that. Um, although one of the things that he intended to do was to reconstitute the Icelandic parliament and, and set Iceland up as an independent state. Now, this kind of uh, led to a, a, a series of weird things where um, basically up until that time, people in Iceland hadn't really dared to hope that there was ever any possibility of, of running an independent country. And, you know, but around the 1860s, a lot of uh, you know, romance poets, mostly Icelandic students who had gone to Copenhagen to study, uh, started to talk you know, proactively about the idea of independence. And, and this, of course, you know, kind of steamrolled to the point where in 1884, the uh, Danish king said, OK, OK, fine, you can have a constitution, right? Are you happy now? And, you know, this was, uh, you know, ni nicely made up as part of the thousand year celebration of Icelandic settlement. But, um, of course, people pushed on and, and, you know, it took a couple more decades. But in 1918, Iceland got um, sovereignty, which is essentially the same thing as, uh, as you got with the devolved parliament, in that uh, the parliament was reinstated uh, in, in proper terms. Uh, it was uh, given a lot of leeway around self-determination, but still you know, had the Danish king at the top and still had to like, uh, be deferential to the, the Danish um, uh, parliament and Danish government. So 1944, while Denmark was um, uh, 
basically occupied by Germany um, and couldn't really say no. Uh, <laughs> Iceland decided that you know they would sneak out and just in declare independence. Of course, at the time, Iceland was occupied by Britain. You know, um, but uh, the current constitution of Iceland is from 1944. It, um, the 1944 constitution is actually mostly unchanged from the 1918 constitution. They mostly just removed the word king and put the word president instead. They made a couple of uh, other little changes. Uh, some of them were grammatical, oddly enough. Um, but um, but the, uh, at the end of the 1944 constitution, it was stated, this, uh, this constitution shall be reviewed in full no later than 1945. Uh, so um, that was nice. They they wanted to do that, but um, uh, nothing happened in 1945, of course. Uh, since 1944, there have been a, a total of six changes to the Icelandic constitution. Most of them have to do with with redistricting the. Uh, so there are six electoral districts or or constituencies in Iceland for the parliament. Um, and uh, there was uh, so the, there was a two-tier uh, like bicameral parliament to begin with, and that was done away with in the in the 1980s. And then the the most significant change was 1996, sorry, when we they had a human rights chapter, uh, essentially just uh, codifying the European Convention on Human Rights uh, that you know was done um, pretty much all around Europe in that decade. Um, so, one of the things that happened kind of uh, in the uh, early 90s was, um, uh, you remember Margaret Thatcher, anybody? Uh, so, um, she had a posse in Iceland as well, and um, her, her ilk uh, managed to rise to governance, uh, first in the city of Reykjavik, uh, and then, then in the parliament, and, and the, uh, this guy, David Otson, who started his career as a comedian, um, well, lawyer, comedian, uh, mayor, prime minister, foreign minister, central bank manager, and now he's the editor of one of the largest newspapers. You know, there's no corruption, of course. There's no, there's nothing weird about this. But uh, he he was running the show under this uh, massive prog uh, pro program of liberalisation and deregulation and and whatnot. And this was all well and good, except in. The, early 2000s it kind of hit this tipping point or inflection point where uh, suddenly you know the newly privatized uh, formerly state banks uh, started to be very aggressive in buying up large swaths of London and Copenhagen and you know uh, many people at that time felt like this was you know finally we're we're getting our own back for all of the trouble they caused in the past these damn you know Danish people and these damn Brits uh, and you know but there, uh, there was this massive expansion, and then, um, so by the end of 2008, people uh, started to use, oh, that's so 2007, as a uh, kind of um, a swear word as, uh, of sorts. Because in 2007, we were rich, we were decadent, we were a world finance capital of sorts. In 2008, and uh, end of that, we had uh, people protesting austerity on the streets, um, unemployment went from about 1% to about 9% over the course of about two months. Uh, and about 17 18 of the entire economy uh, essentially disappeared over the course of a week. So, you know, that wasn't very good. It was somewhat embarrassing. But, um, you know, uh, people protested. There were slogans. Some of them were quite fun. Um, that top one, Helvid is fucking fuck, became, you know, it, it means exactly what it sounds like. It, <laughs> it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't really have any political statement, but it is quite, um, quite telling of the, the type of frustration people were feeling. Um, and what, what essentially happened was that uh, the, the right-wing government that had been running the show um, David Otson had been prime minister for 16 years, um, and essentially that government had to step down. And a new uh, new government took over in the early days of 2009, um, with uh, the Social Democrats and Left Greens running the show. And um, this kind of opened up a lot of options because, you know, basically after the economy collapses, you kind of go like, okay, what do we do now? Maybe we ought to 
fix things. Okay, how do we fix things? And one of the big demands that came up was the idea that we should actually start writing a new constitution because the old one was just kind of not very good. Uh, you know, it was a 19th century hand-me-down that was written for the purposes of 19th century Danish bureaucrats and it didn't really suit the purposes of a 21st century like Western liberal democracy, right? So um, this is kind of a vague timeline of, of what, uh, what's going on. And the new government uh, was kind of uh, perceptive to this entire um, argument that maybe it's time for something new. And uh, on a completely different thread, in late 2009, um, a, a group that was called the Antil Collective, I'll, I'll come back to this, um, they, they said, okay, you know, we need to figure out what it means to be Icelandic now. The collapse you know, led us into this situation where we don't really like, have a direction as a society. We, we don't know what we want to do with ourselves. So they orchestrated that 1,500 people be randomly selected from the census and, uh, and like, gotten together in this big uh, uh, sports arena for a full day of sitting around, um, coming up with new ideas for what Iceland should be. And, you know, okay, 1,500 people isn't a lot, but remember, this is Iceland, right? Uh, 330,000 people, so this is about 0.1% of the population. Uh, no, 0.5%, sorry, of the population. So, you know, it is actually quite statistically significant at that point. Um, and what these people did, so just to explain the process a little bit, they, uh, in the first round, so everybody was put on randomly onto um, tables with about seven people on each table, one of whom had been pre-selected uh, and, and trained to be a facilitator. Uh, so basically given instructions on how to make sure that one person doesn't dominate the discussion and how, how to kind of keep things going, but also was, was taught the process. In the first round, they wrote these little tickets, just one idea per ticket, just uh, you know, something like you know, somebody might write democracy and another person might, uh, might write education or you know, whatever it was. And then they'd you know, go several circles, uh, show their tickets one by one and explain what the rationale was behind it. And then they would uh, put little stickers, you know, so each person got a certain number of stickers as votes and would vote on the best uh, ideas that had come up on their table. And then there was a break. And during the break, all of these little tickets were taken into the back and processed, uh, written up and statistically aggregated so that when people came into the next, uh, next round, there were statistics up on the wall showing you know, what the total group of 1,500 people was, you know, were thinking. And then, you know, second round, it went deeper, so instead of just simple ideas, it would become more complicated ideas, like statements about specific topic areas. And then by the end of the day, they came up with uh, a large set of, of statements about what the country should be like. But this wasn't about a constitution, this was a, a general thing. They, uh, the Antil Collective just wanted to know, you know, what is Iceland now? But um, when the uh, the government decided that, okay, let's do this constitutional thing, let's, let's build a new constitution. They decided that this process had been so uh, useful and it was very popular and it was just a very good process. So they emulated it and got people together again by the same random selection from the census to go into, instead of this kind of broad nebulous question of what is Iceland now or where should we be or what are our values, it became, what should our constitution say? And over the course of another day, this time in, um, in October 2010, people uh, wrote down all of this kind of stuff that became the ingredients for the new constitution. And uh, the uh, outcome was you know, uh, kind of fairly uh, predictable. This is kind of just a random world cl a word cloud, uh, so Iceland, nation above it, land is land, of course, um, constitution. But then you have more interesting stuff around the rims, like um, natural resources and education and guarantees and independence and um, 
uh, and uh, personal voting and that kind of thing, um, equality. So, you know, people were coming up with stuff that was entirely predictable in a certain way for what should be in a constitution, but there are also a lot of like kind of weird, wacky ideas that people were quite uh, in favor of, such as, you know, uh, freedom of media, access to information, um, uh, referendums or, or initiative and referendum mechanisms, that kind of thing. And uh, this was all well and good, and this got handed over to, uh, to a committee who prepared uh, the work for the Constitutional Council. Now, the Constitutional Council was intended to be a constitutional assembly, uh, different from the 1,000 person assembly. It was supposed to be an elected 25 uh, person group from, from the general public. Uh, so a, a, an election was called for, 523 candidates ran uh, as individuals without any political parties behind them. And, uh, uh, you know, that, that's kind of crazy when you have 523 people running for 25 seats. Um, it's, it's a very weird um, dynamic that kind of came up. But um, the elections came and went, and then shortly after the elections, one of the candidates uh, uh, sued for annulment, and the Supreme Court came to the conclusion that, yes, in fact, there were six violations of the election law. And uh, so one of these violations was that when, uh, when people got the ballot sheets, they were kind of flat, right? Uh, and people were supposed to hand them in flat because they came flat. Because the election law says that uh, the ballot should be put into the ballot box with exactly the same fold as they had when they were received. But the Supreme Court said they didn't have a fold, therefore they were not legal ballots. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> that's an odd one. No, that doesn't sound like the intent of that particular law, but fair enough. Uh, another one was that uh, the, the law says that the ballot boxes, uh, oh no, the, the, um, uh, the kind of rooms that you go into to vote, that they should, uh, the, the walls on them should go right from the ground all the way to the ceiling. <laughs> And this was fine, except uh, in, in some places like Reykjavik Town Hall, where the ceiling is, is like uh, six or seven meters high, um, they decided to just cut off at about two and a half meters, assuming that nobody would be that tall. <laughs> and of course, you know, this was considered to be illegal because, you know, of course, and uh, you know, entirely ignoring all the facts that, that all of the other elections up until that point had had exactly the same format, you know, that didn't, didn't matter. The, this was just a process that needed to be killed as far as the uh, Supreme Court was concerned. So, so the election got annulled, which put the government in a very weird position. They had the option of just dropping the entire process, which nobody would have really liked, but, but you know, except the um, right-wing conservative party that really did not want the process to go forward. Or, alternatively, they could spend another $300 million, uh, Kronas, sorry, which is a fairly substantially lower number than uh, dollars or pounds or anything like that. Um, uh, I guess it's about 150, no, it's about 1.5 1, 1 million pounds, right, um, on running another election. Only that would annoy the electorate who probably wouldn't show up that time to vote. And it would annoy the candidates who you know, just spent all that time and effort campaigning and then you know, only to have to do the entire thing over again. It just wouldn't be a very elegant solution. So they came up with the third option, which was, um, okay, let's just create, uh, let's just appoint a council, a constitutional council. And let's have 25 seats in that council. And let's appoint to the council the people who would have won if the election had been legal. <laughs> it's a fairly good solution, right? Um, so these are them, uh, it's a fairly good crowd. And um, uh, around the same time, so uh, disclosure, I ran in that election but lost. I, uh, you know. But then again, so did 498 others. <laughs> 
Um, well, strictly speaking, so did 523 others because it wasn't an election, right? Um, but uh, me and a friend of mine, Elinor Saita, started this um, thing that we called the uh, Constitutional Analysis Support Team. And because both uh, Ella and I work a bit in computer security, information security, we have all these methods for doing um, analysis on, on computer software to try and figure out if there are vulnerabilities and bugs and things that could be abused by, by people with, you know, who are with evil intent. And we said, you know, and we were sitting in a Thai restaurant in Reykjavik, kind of you know, eating pad thai or something, when we came up with this idea and went like, why can't we use that for law? Why can't we use exactly the same analytical tools as we use to verify the validity of software to verify the validity of a constitution? And it turns out you can. So we started doing that and, and basically um, the, the Constitutional Council uh, started writing their... Um, uh, for, if there are any linguists in the room, this is incorrect. Um, but yeah. Uh, they started to, uh, to work and they worked for a three month period and at the end of each week they would publish uh, their most recent draft constitution on the internet. And um, so the first week they only came up with a rough structure, what chapters they wanted, more or less, and you know, some kind of basic wording of, of what, what else they might want to put in there. Um, but by the second week, they'd started to flesh out the human rights chapter, and then they started to work on the executive and the judiciary and, and so on and so forth. And every passing week, we would take the output and we'd run it through you know, various kinds of analysis. And sometimes we found big problems, like um, you know, the, uh, the court of impeachment being um, overmanned by the parliament and therefore the same people were doing the impeaching and the judgment on the impeaching. So we reported this back. And the Constitutional Council were accepting feedback in various forms. So we are not the only group doing this. There were groups all over society uh, with interest in economics, in, uh, in new types of currencies, in uh, social welfare and housing, and you know, whichever topic it was, you know, education through to animal welfare, they were all sending in comments. And these comments were uh, very largely uh, sent through Facebook messages, through Twitter, uh, the occasional YouTube video. Some people sent them email, and then you know, just to round it all off, they also had a comment thing on on a website. Uh, plus, anybody was free to come and and uh, witness the uh, the proceedings as they were working, and and kind of uh, even weigh in uh, in private. You know, not not disturbing the process, but. Uh, but this meant that uh, every week people were seeing their feedback being in, uh, included into this draft document and we could see its evolution from week to week. It was a fairly impressive con uh, process, I, I would say. So they, ended, they finished their work at the end of July 2011 and you know, by then, you know, and remember 2011 is a kind of crazy year. That's the year of the Arab Spring. That's the year when you know, the student riots and all that in, in England. Um, and you know, it, was, uh, it was a very powerful year of political tensions. But uh, by October, um, when the Icelandic parliament started its 140th session, um, it received the, the kind of new constitutional uh, proposal and essentially stuck it under a chair and didn't do anything for practically a full year. Uh, they did decide in April 2012 that, um, that it would be good to have a non-binding referendum in October. Now the reason it had to be non-binding has to do with the way the current constitution stipulates um, how the constitution shall be changed. Because uh, currently you need uh, parliament to agree to a law which changes the constitution. Uh, and the moment such a law has been passed, parliament is automatically dissolved and a uh, general election is called for. The new, uh, new parliament comes in and they have to verify the same law without changes. And if that happens, then, then that new change to the constitution takes effect immediately. And this sounds like a fairly reasonable process in many ways. 
Uh, it is actually in practice a bit weird because uh, you would think that that would mean that the election, the general election would be about the constitutional change, but in practice it isn't. Um, but either way, this meant that, that the public could not actually uh, vote on changing the constitution, they could only provide input. And uh, there was, so um, in October a referendum, and this is uh, the ballot uh, sheet for that. It was six questions, here they are. So, uh, do you wish for the Constitutional Council's proposals to form the basis for a new, uh, new draft constitution? Which is a bit nebulous uh, in, in the wording. Uh, it doesn't say, do you want the Constitutional Council's proposal to become the constitution? Um, that would have been more clear wording, but fair enough. Um, and then they asked, uh, so that's the main question, and they, then they asked five clarification questions about things that they in the Parliament had not been able to come to a, uh, an acceptable conclusion about um, amongst themselves. So one being about the ownership of natural resources. Um, the Constitutional Council had come to the conclusion that common ownership, just essentially the commons, were a good idea. And that you know resource usage should be licensed, or or you know at least there shouldn't be property rights over over natural resources. Sounds like a reasonable idea, right? Uh, but they had to check on that one. They also um, there is a national state like a state church in Iceland, uh, which is um, you know not really my cup of tea, but fair enough. And they decided to ask whether people wanted to include that in the new constitution or not. Then, yeah, election of particular individuals uh, to the parliament. So rather than uh, electing parties that you elect individuals, that was uh, something that, uh, you know, they, they asked to a greater extent than is curr uh, currently uh, the case at present, which, you know, meant they weren't going to drop the party system. Of course they weren't, they're parliament. But they were maybe open to the idea of allowing people to um, choose which representatives they prefer and, and maybe even for people to run without parties behind them. Um, and then uh, provision so for equal, uh, so that all votes around the country have equal weight. Uh, this is a weird request in Iceland because uh, because the, of the way the election system works there, it's a proportional voting system that where uh, any leftover votes in one uh, constituency after all of the votes have been allocated to seats, any leftover votes start to rotate clockwise around the country. So they go over to the next constituency over and so on, you know, allocated to the same parties until uh, either all of the seats are allocated all around the country or, uh, or the votes are depleted, you know, whichever happens first. It's a fairly sensible system and it means that in practice most votes are qu fairly close to equal, but there is a slight differential. This isn't anywhere near as big as the differential between, say, um, certain parts of, um, uh, of Sussex versus, say, the Isle of Wight, you know, where 20,000 people versus 102,000 people um, behind one parliamentary seat. But, you know, they decided they want, uh, wanted to make that a bit more even. And then... Um, uh, they also wanted to ask whether, whether people actually wanted there to be initiative and referendum mechanisms. And the proposal from the Constitution, uh, Constitutional Council actually contained three such provisions. Um, one was a 10% threshold for uh, the public to automatically enter a bill into Parliament so that it gets injected into the process without there having to be a parliamentarian sponsoring it. So just a way of actually just putting a bill on the table. Uh, the second was a 3% uh, of the population could put a, um, a parliamentary resolution proposal into the parliamentary process. And then the last one was a 1% uh, would be sufficient to uh, demand that any bill gets pushed to a referendum. And that was pretty good. Um, uh, especially if you notice the little hack in there, that if you have 10% supporting a bill going into the Parliament, then you, by implication, have the 1% needed to push it to referendum. 
right? Uh, clever. So the results from this referendum were a resounding yes, 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 yes. Um, uh, the, the closest one was one about the state church. Uh, the state church is not particularly popular in Iceland. Um, it is a country where most people claim to be atheist, but a large number of those atheists say that the state church is kind of cuddly. You know, they, um, but then there was a spanner thrown in the work. So two days after the referendum, we find out that, um, that the parliament had asked a team of three lawyers to go through the proposed constitution with a fine tooth comb and figure out if there's any problems in the legal language. They were not supposed to change the content of the constitution. They were not supposed to remove anything, they were not supposed to add anything, they were just supposed to tighten up the legal language. So this is the, um, uh, an example of the changes they made. You'll notice uh, this entire paragraph here about information freedom that they removed. Um, they also remove you know, lots of other things. Um, uh, here's another page from them where they also remove stuff. So, um, uh, all hell broke loose when, when uh, you know, people were like, no, 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 that's not what you're, what you're told to do. Um, no, we're not okay with that. And uh, most of December 2012 was kind of wasted on this weird political debate about whether um, the three lawyers who had a mandate to fix the legal terminology uh, had more standing than the um, semi-quasi-elected constitutional council. Um, but eventually, uh, I think it was late January by, by the time uh, people actually said, okay, okay, fine, we'll put it back you know, the way it was without any legal fix-ups. Um, but we demand that it be sent to the Venice Commission of the Council of Europe, uh, who are like this body of, of constitutional experts from uh, all of the Council of Europe countries, so that's 48 countries, um, and get them to, to give the new constitution their blessing. At which point it was kind of obvious that they were just you know, finding reasons or methods to stall until the election. But that happened, it went through, the second discussion happened, the third discussion happened, and May 2013 was when the next general election was supposed to happen. And so, pretty much the day before the uh, parliament was dissolved for the, uh, to go to the general election, um, the new leader of the Social Democrat Party, his, his party had been you know, running, running this and kind of pushing for this at the beginning, uh, partially because uh, the, uh, the Prime Minister, who used to be the, uh, the leader of the Social Democrats, uh, she, she's a formidable woman, she's, she's really impressive, uh, has a long history of uh, of kind of activism in the parliament and uh, not always in such a way as I agreed with her, but still. Uh, she is kind of most famous for, for having said, you know, in, in a powerful tone sometime in the early 90s, my time will come, and certainly it did. Um, and, you know, as prime minister, she, she kind of was considering her legacy. And the, the entire par uh, constitutional process could be considered part of that. But the new leader of Social Democrats who took over when she was retired um, said, well, you know, I'm not sure about this thing. No, the, the Conservatives are probably going to win the next election. Uh, and you know, we don't want them to be able to kill this. Uh, we don't want them to be able to take the election on the basis of this. It's probably a, a safer game to play to just take it off the table and, and just act like it never happened. But, of course, they did um, throw in a new constitutional bill at the last minute. Uh, and you, you'll notice how the first, second and third discussions, so all parliamentary bills are required to go through three discussions, um, they're kind of nicely spaced out over the uh, space of about a year. Um, the new parliament, uh, new bill for uh, changing the constitution just added one clause, which was that uh, a um, two-thirds majority of the parliament could change the constitution for the next four years. 
uh, without uh, the parliament having to be dis uh, dissolved and go to election. And this constitutional change uh, was not uh, sent to the Venice Commission. There was no team of three lawyers appointed to, uh, to look through that particular constitutional change, uh, nor was any of the other uh, you know, kind of speed bumps in the process involved uh, like put in there. And the three discussions about the new constitutional proposal um, all happened within the space of two hours. So that happened, um, and then there were general elections, and you know, a new conservative populist government. Uh, I'm, I'm using populist basically as a kind of nice way of saying fascist. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, they, um, the, the progressive party, as they call themselves, uh, who are about as progressive as something that's not very progressive, um, they, they now have the Prime Minister's uh, office and, and various other things and you know, they, they've actually been playing the racist card and actually getting a lot of support for that and they've been doing all sorts of things that I thought, w you know, uh, would have thought four years ago would be absolutely impossible to do in Iceland with any measure of success. But there we are, that's where we are today. So, all of this kind of comes back you know, to a certain point of, of warning, right? Because you're in the middle of this very interesting process for, you know, essentially trying to achieve more self-determination. And there are people who are out there to say, no, you should not gain more self-determination. You should not be independent. You should not get any of the freedoms that come with being independent um, because we say so. And right now, you know, the, the things that they're doing to stop you, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb and uh, assume that most people in here are from the yes campaign, or at least yes side of the table. Those of you who aren't, okay, uh, hopefully I'll, I'll help to convince you otherwise. Um, but, you know, the, the people who are very strongly in favor of no are currently... Um, maybe steering the media debate a little bit, maybe you know, um, putting all sorts of weird landmines in the process, such as saying that, you know, oh, you can't join the European Union if you go independent, or what, are, what currency are you going to use, or you know, any number of other things that, that actually, if you uh, go right down to it, is completely irrelevant and useless and pointless to even talk about, because every country that has gained independence ever has found a way to solve these problems. But you see what happened in Iceland, this kind of slow biting process of uh, you know, just putting one roadblock in after another until the process could be killed. And I'm pretty sure that as you get closer to referendum day, you're gonna see some very, very big roadblocks. So figuring out ways to anticipate those roadblocks might be uh, interesting. But ultimately, this, you know, the, the vast shape of democracy is, is a complicated beast. We, uh, we go around in most countries in the world now claiming, oh yeah, we have democracy. You know, there are countries out there like the Democratic Republic of Congo <laughs> that are neither democratic nor a particularly functional republic. Um, and then you have the United Kingdom um, that by pretty much any measure, actually, like, if you just do a, a function by function comparison of the British government and the Iranian government, they are actually homogenous, <laughs> right? They, they, they fit into each other perfectly. Instead of the Ayatollah, you have a queen. And yeah, okay, I, I'm not going to um, uh, you know, belabor that particular metaphor. But, you know, uh, there is this really salient question of, of what gets to be called a democracy nowadays. And we also have to you know, ask ourselves, you know, when we're doing a, a new constitution or building a new society, what could possibly go wrong? And most of the time, you know, people will come up with all sorts of fear-driven excuses because fear is a very good motivator to do nothing. And you know, ultimately, the, the Icelandic experience has been that it is easier to, to go on for four years of arguing back and forth about you know, stuff that doesn't actually matter 
and then ultimately choose to do nothing. Because you know, changing the way you live, changing the way your society is structured, is actually a fairly large leap. And when it comes right down to it, you know, people will be slightly more conservative when push comes to shove. So, so when we were dealing with the constitution in Iceland, you know, we, there were a lot of interesting challenges. The, most lawyers uh, said they didn't like the idea of the new constitution, which is strange to me because uh, I would have thought they would have gotten a lot more work after, you know, but wait, all of the laws changed overnight? What are we going to do? Uh, but, but they said, oh no, there's going to be so much legal uncertainty. We, we can't stand for that. That's going to be uh, complicated and, and uh, yeah, as if laws have never been written before. And right-wing people, uh, in Iceland there's this kind of weird thing going back, uh, all the way back to Jörn Jönsson's time or even further, where about 10 families who are typically put in the, uh, uh, on the right-wing side of Icelandic politics, um, the conservative right-wing as opposed to the liber uh, liberal right-wing, um, have essentially controlled the country for the last two or three centuries. Um, but that's uh, something you know, that um, we can't really do much about. But it led to the fact that right-wing people did not want to lose the power that they were implicitly given by the failings in the structure of the old constitution. Conservative wing, okay, that's odd, um, I, typing too fast. Um, yeah, conservative people uh, generally didn't like it because you know, <laughs> newfangled weird stuff, we, we don't want this. Yeah, the old one has worked for us for, for 100 years, why do we need to change anything? And then, you know, people outside of Reykjavik, um, a lot of people outside of Reykjavik, Reykjavik has about, or the greater Reykjavik area, has about two-thirds of the population of Iceland. And people outside of there tend to be somewhat cynical and suspicious whenever people in Reykjavik are excited about something. And for good reason, I guess. Uh, I mean, very frequently what people in Reykjavik are excited about is, is stuff that's going to cause more poverty and, and desolation in the, uh, in the countryside. So people were reasonably cynical and, and the government actually did zero um, things to uh, try and alleviate some of those fears. And then older people, um, again, I think that has some relationship with conservatism. But uh, the question is, you know, how much of the same applies here? I kind of get the impression that, that at least one of these doesn't, uh, which is, uh, you know, the, the uh, fourth one here about, you know, because um, Edinburgh is not that big in comparison to Scotland. You've got, you know, a much kind of wider social dynamic. It isn't as if you have two thirds of your population in one place. But apart from that, you know, isn't this exactly the same threat model? Isn't this essentially the same kind of argumentation or same demographics of argumentation that you're going to see? So, um, so what happens in that kind of scenario? Well, in Iceland, what happened was that 67% of the population was you know, still in favor of it, um, but only because, well, who would ever stand against it, right? And of course, this is a nonsense statement because <laughs> There were lots of old people, there were lots of conservative people, there were lots of people from every walk of life who were actually quite excited about the idea of a new constitution. But, you know, the debate got entirely sidetracked and sidelined and, and put into a nice media spin. And ultimately, people who had lots of power and lots of vested interests got the better of us. So, you know, vested interests... Um, I always like the story of the Luddite uprising. Uh, it's kind of one of my, my favorite things because ultimately this was another battle about self-determination. Um, Ned Ludd uh, being the leader of the Luddite movement um, who essentially were 19th century terrorists or at least they'd be called that now and be arrested under uh, the Terrorism Act and, and be uh, sent to somewhere. Uh, and actually, this led to you know two different laws. Uh, I really like this. Um, so, uh, law. Uh, this is kind of the first example or the frame breaking act of of uh, 1806. Um, I think is the first example of a law 
uh, in kind of modern world where, or kind of recent history, where property rights were uh, considered to be of higher value than, than human lives. But the reason I'm, I'm pointing at this entire Luddite angle is that the, the exact same thing was happening, only some of the facts were in reverse. You had uh, this you know, strange kind of movement uh, trying to change things, but they, they ultimately owned the process and, and could decide whatever they wanted. And uh, the Luddites were the, the guys saying, hey, wait, 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 hang on a moment. You know, is this actually in our best interest? And they weren't actually anti-technology, as is always said. Uh, if you actually read the writings of the Luddites, they, they were entirely pro-technology. They were just rather concerned about who gets to own it. Owning the process is kind of important, especially when you're building a new state or a new society. So what is to be gained from, from independence then? Well, first off, you know, societies are really messy. They, you know, societies kind of just get, get all sorts of crazy at all sorts of times for all sorts of reasons. And sometimes you have to go like, yeah, maybe it's better off if we just let some, somebody else manage this, right? It's a lot easier to have somebody in London deal with all of the complexity, isn't it? But what you gain is... So the entire European issue, you know, um, we have you know, uh, David Cameron asking Manuel Barroso to, uh, to say some unkind words about the future prospects of Scotland, um, just in case you know, anybody's listening to Manuel Barroso. Um, and, you know, kind of about the same week as uh, he, he made those statements, you know, about Scotland probably not being able to get into the European Union, um, they sent uh, a delegation from OLAF, which is the uh, European anti-corruption uh, unit that also uh, does some things about, um, you know, guaranteeing corruption levels or measuring corruption levels uh, prior to a session. They sent them to Ukraine. And you'd have to wonder, why is a, a, a European Union uh, anti-corruption uh, body operating in a country that is not part of the European Union? Huh. Well, so um, two weeks ago I was in Brussels and I met this uh, fairly high-level political, like, um, uh, let, let's say somebody who's got all of his fingers in all of the pies. And... Uh, he says, oh yeah, look, the Olaf thing, um, that is proof that Scotland will be let in, right? If you want to be, because ultimately um, they cannot be fast-tracking Ukraine in and then not um, admitting a um, you know, nor uh, North European uh, state with a long history of, of you know, not being corrupt, right? So, you know, uh, the, the general consensus uh, amongst people who are in the know in, in Brussels appears to be that every single reason that has been manufactured for why people in Scotland should say no is actually based on falsehood. Simple as that. Now, so you can gain, you can remain in the European Union. You can also get this wonderful thing of economic self-determination, which, you know, in the worst case means that you all get reduced to peasant farmers. But at least you're peasant farmers working on your own terms then. More realistically, you have 21st century infrastructure, you have information technology, you have communications capability. Um, until 2007, uh, Edinburgh was uh, the seven, in 17th place over the uh, world's financial uh, centers. Of course, t 2013, it was in 64th place, but you know, things kind of fluctuate a bit, I guess, in the financial sector. Um, you also have the fact that you know, over, uh, over the last 20 years, about 20 billion pounds worth of uh, unspent tax revenue collected in, in Scotland got sent to England to pay off whatever debts are there. So it's not as if Scotland is, is poor, you know, you are actually a fairly good, um, you know, strongly economically independent country. So, you know, I'd say, you know, the likelihood of you becoming that guy is entirely limited to how much you want to be that guy. Then 
there's the issue of local control of local wealth. Um, you know, I could talk about oil here, but you know, just assume that I'm talking about oil when I talk about whiskey. So, 80% of, of uh, Scottish whiskey is, is uh, owned by English and American companies, which means that uh, about 80% of the wealth that gets generated by that uh, goes out of Scotland. Does that sound like oil to you? Because I, I think it's actually worse in the oil industry. So oh, you have an option here, and, and you know, here's an interesting kind of thing where, where I say, you know, welcome to Scandinavia, right? Because you could operate in, on the exact same terms as a Norwegian government. You can set up a sovereign wealth fund, you can um, you know, uh, benefit directly from, from, all of the, um, from all of the oil sales and whatnot. And let's say that you're environmentalists. I don't know if you are, but if you were, then, then you'd be thinking, oh yeah, we need to stop that oil thing from happening. Well, how about you have this sovereign wealth fund and you take, say, 20, 30, 40%, you can pick any percentage you like, you can pick 52.9 if you want, uh, percent of the profits that go into that sovereign, uh, sovereign wealth fund and use it to fund university research into renewable energy. I know that's a crazy idea, but you know, you've got to start somewhere, right? The point here is that you know, once you have local control over the local wealth, you have infinite possibilities to actually expand and, and build things whichever which way you like. And you can, you know, Scotland does seem to me much closer to Scandinavia than it does to England. So, you know, culturally, politically, etc. So if you operate on a Scandinavian model, you know, you can probably even join some of our Nordic Council and, and stuff like that, because why not? And you can modernize your protocols of governance, essentially uh, kill common law, because common law is a bit silly, uh, and adopt civil law. I don't know, that's maybe, no, nah, never mind, okay. Um, and then you might have options for democracy. Um, yeah, uh, that, that's, that's always a, a big question. Um, so, incidentally, last weekend I was there. Um, this is uh, the chalet at Mezehiria in Kiev, um, uh, President Yanukovych's former residence. And he was, um, he had basically managed to privatize a big national park into his own pocket and then built a very big palace there that, you know, expropriating 38 billion euros from the uh, Ukrainian public. Um, does that sound familiar? <laughs> oh, no, I'm not going to make any comments on that. And then finally, you know, you can have this option of a cultural rebirth because, you know, everybody loves Scotland, right? Everybody loves the Scottish. But, you know, really, you know, as cool as the Edinburgh Festival is and, you know, and everything like that. And, you know, um, Robert Louis Stevenson's kind of one of my favorite uh, poets and authors, you know. But really, Scottish cities are not exactly known for being the cultural hubs of the world. I'm afraid to say it, you know, sorry. People will go to Paris and Berlin and London, unfortunately. Um, you know, people even go to Reykjavik. Reykjavik is a very cool city. Everybody loves going to Reykjavik. It could be the same here, because you can create whichever culture you want. Do it whichever way you want. But at the end of the day, it is up to you guys. Should Scotland be an independent country? Right now, not looking too good. I don't know how skewed this is. I'm told it is skewed. I'm told that it's skewed in favor of yes, or like, you know, in favor of no, so that in practice it'll be quite a resounding yes come September. I really hope that's right, because I kind of like this place, and I think it would be a whole lot better if it were independent. So that's that. Thank you. <laughs> was the process too elongated and at that first you know spirit of revolution from the pots and pans yeah. revolution really by the time you got to 2013 really got dissipated 
and you've got a right-wing government elect maybe the, you know, the answer is uh, it should be a little quicker yeah. Yeah, the process yeah uh, absolutely uh, I, I fully agree with that and actually so one is just make it quicker um, to capture the moment but also um, not allowing people to have time to come up with you know creative ways of slowing things down because for every slowdown that happened two more slowdowns showed up mm. so yeah I don't know is the referendum in September binding Ah, see, <laughs> that's that sounds like potential for roadblocks right there. The Edinburgh Agreement says both sides will accept themselves, but you will find there will be lots of obstacles placed and there will be lots of tough yeah. negotiations. But I think once Scotland has voted, if it does vote, for it, then you know, the process will continue. But there will be questions. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's uh, it's a tough one. All right, thanks. Uh, could I ask, uh, the, the process of consultation and these, the, the national assemblies that we had and the involvement of um, half a percent of your entire population, to what extent did that uh, excite and energize people or maybe even radicalize them, the process of actually having that discussion? And now that you've went through all of that to end up with a, a in your own words, a, a conservative fascist government, yeah. um, What's the legacy of that? Have people just gone away, or, mm. or, or you know, has, has something fundamentally changed beneath the surface that needs to regroup and, and, and come back? Because I, yeah. I think here in Scotland we need to think about that too. Because yeah. one of the great things about the debate we've had in the last couple of years is that you know the genie is out of the bottle now. A lot of people who never thought about it before are excited about the prospect. Of becoming, uh, a, you know, a progressive, independent yeah. country and doing things here and in the world, and no matter what the outcome in September the 18th, that isn't going to go away. Right. So I'm just wondering, yeah. you know, what's the legacy of that process in Iceland? Yeah. So, a lot of people kind of experienced a certain political awakening around the pots and pans revolution. I mean, prior to that, people didn't really protest in Iceland. That just didn't really happen. It had happened once before in any significant fashion in 1949 when Iceland was one of the founding members of NATO. And uh, this was decided by the parliament at the time and the public was, was very much against this idea. Um, there were massive protests uh, and it was the first of two times when tear gas has been used in Iceland. The second was during the Pots and Pans revolution uh, just before the, the government resigned. So, you know, a lot of people kind of, kind of uh, came of age in a certain sense politically during that era. And that's not going to go away for everybody. But at the same time, I do feel like the, the length of the process and how hard it was to, to kind of you know, go through all of the hoops and how, how it kind of got captured by the bureaucrats meant that, uh, that a lot of people just kind of got tired and dogged and, you know, in many cases burned out. Many of my, you know, good activist friends in Iceland who have been fighting, you know, for, for years and years and years for systemic change are now just at the end of their rope. They just uh, can't fight anymore. Um, and I hope they will regain the ability to do so because, you know, three years from now there's another general election and we have the ability to take that constitution that was written and put it back on the agenda and actually get it through this time. Because as you say, the genie is out of the bottle. But, you know, the question is how many genies are there and what are people wishing for? You know, it's, uh, it's not necessary that, um, you know, e even if it's like 10, 20 percent of the population suddenly realize that they have power, that's not u really useful unless we have you know, a total aggregate of more than 50%, right? So it's going to take some time. Can we take, um, Peter, do you have a question and, and a gentleman here? Can we take two questions together? And we'll, yeah. Yeah. An almost forgotten writer. American longshoreman Eric Coffer wrote a book in the 50s called The True Believer and it was an analysis of the genesis and the development of mass movements 
And we certainly have a mass movement in Scotland, one that we've never had anything like it before, arguably. But Ed Hoffer makes a point, and it's a chilling point, that mass movements go through the phase of the men of words and the women of words, the complex analysis, the arguments, the focus on the constitutions. But there comes a point when the people of action have to appear that are not advocating going to the streets and, and burning flags, but we have 95 days to go. Mm -hmm. The time for complex social analysis I'm not saying it's past, but I think it has to be put on the shelf. We have to be concentrating on the core essence of the arguments if we're to have any chance at all. In a sense, we're down to what Eric Offer modeled his book on, which was the essays of Montaigne. And there were a series of aphorisms, of simple statements of belief. And these are not yet, in my humble view, strong enough, clear, clearly delineated enough to carry us through, mm -hmm. it has to be anything the Icelandic experience that mirrors that. Mm. I, I think so. Uh, I think the main takeaway of what I've been trying to say is that you know is kind of in the form of a warning that uh, at some point somebody is going to try and take over the process and they're going to try and uh, change the uh, the debate. And while you know there is a time for words and there's a time for action, uh, it would be an absolute pity if if all the action is wasted in the wrong place when when push comes to shove because it wasn't the right type of analysis going on. Um, but in Iceland so far, you know, there haven't been many people of action stepping forward. Um, there are people who, who have uh, kind of gained prominence in the political scene and are making, you know, fairly big statements, but ultimately they, they haven't been, um, you know, capable of steering this thing in any direction which the population would like to go. So uh, I don't know if you want the strong man to appear or the, the uh, benevolent dictator. Uh, I certainly am not a fan of that model. But, you know, uh, but when you ask for heroes, that's often what you get. And I'd rather have you know, an entire population of heroes than just a, a handful emerging at the right moment or the wrong moment, as it often is. Right. <laughs> Um, well, I was going to say two things. First of all, we've been very lucky with our lawyers in Scotland. Mm. Um, Tony Blair didn't really ever want us to get the first parliament. And when we sent a, a real watch watch your bill, and luckily we had Donald Dewar and Wendy Alexander, who were both lawyers, and within a couple of days they had actually straightened up and it was ready to discuss within about a week. So I actually think you're very, very lucky in this country that our lawyers are right there with us. Yep. But as far as crowdsourcing the constitution goes, um, you will probably have to do that from scratch. It's not going to be six questions on what we do to get back on the feet again. Right. And, and I think that's where we would probably... I think we'll probably have to start from... There is no UK constitution. Right. So well, I think uh, it makes sense yeah. how we would actually crowdsource yeah. ideas and mechanisms that would make sense. Do you have any ideas about that? Well, so the... National Assembly process where, you know, uh, 1,500 people randomly selected from the census is possibly a good starting point. I mean, you know, it wasn't just six questions there. It was uh, a, a whole tome, you know, it was a, a multi-volume book of, of statements and ideas and, and you know, uh, statistics mostly that came out of that process and it took one day. Now. 1,500 people are not going to be statistically uh, significant here in Scotland. You've got 5 million people, so how about saying 50,000, right? 50,000 sounds like a good number. It's an entirely arbitrary number that I just pulled out of my, yeah. Um, but, you know, pick a number and try to split it up geographically in such a way that you, you uh, gather people together in sports arenas scattered around the country, you know, in some, some way proportionately, and then run a process similar to that one, gather those statistics, get those ideas down, and use the fact that we have, you know, this crazy idea called the internet. It, it, have you heard of it? It's really awesome. <laughs> I really like the internet. You know, 
connect all of those uh, uh, sports arenas together, get all of the data analysis while it's happening, you know, fed into the same thing, and heck, televise it as well. You know, make it into a, a national event bigger than the World Cup. You know, because it can be, right? And that's the starting point. And one of the beautiful things that you have here that, that we did not have in Iceland was that you don't have, uh, there is no written constitution of the UK. Uh, it's, a, it's an absolute shame because it means that you have to be a lawyer in order to know all of the massive sort of constitutional law. But, you know, uh, this means that you have a clean slate so you can't you know, have people saying, oh yeah, we don't have a constitution, you know, oh no, we have a perfectly good constitution because that was one of the, the death knells for our process. So, you know. After this event, there's an event downstairs which is the launch of our new uh, paper Closer. And in this, there's a specific proposal about that process very similar to what Smyr has described that has been developed by a group of uh, thinkers and writers to, to look at how we could do that here. So if you'd like to join us downstairs in 15 minutes when we finish this in the cafe, you'd be very welcome and pick up a copy. Of it, it's, I'm going to have to go and set up. Oh, right. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to leave you. Yeah. Uh, leave. Do you want to... Right? Yeah. Actually, just incidentally, as a, as a weird historical aside note, um, that process that I just described is actually, um, uh, it's actually described, the, fir uh, the first or oldest instance I've been able to find that kind of process being described was in the so-called Green Book by Aral Gaddafi, uh, former president of Libya. Um, who was quite an idealistic man in his youth. I don't know how it lasted through his uh, older age. So, you know, uh, I don't think we should count that against it, that, that he should come up with that as well. But um, we might want to be aware not to fall into the pitfalls he did. Um, yeah. Most of the attention around it is quite promotional. What's to prevent people wanting to round everyday political contestation of the government of the day into a constitution because you're celebrating the state in the constitution yeah how do you limit the power of the constitution so that it isn't anti-political right so it is very it's a very important point you raise um when you're writing a constitution you want it to be timeless uh because one of the worst things that can happen is that 10, 20, 30 years, or even 300 years down the road, um, changes in the social structure, changes in society have, have come to the point where, you know, suddenly um, your constitution is actually standing in the way of progress. This is something I think the United States are running into now with their electoral college, right? Um, that simply the electoral college combined with, with you know, big business and all of that is leading to a process where it's possible for anybody to actually become politically active unless they were born into the correct dynasty. But um, how do you guarantee timelessness? I don't know. Uh, I think ultimately it comes down to, you know, when you're, when you're in the process of writing it, you make sure that, you know, uh, everybody has that question raised for them every now and then that, you know, you're just having a certain mindfulness because, you know, I don't know. If this were something that we'd actually run into uh, in the Icelandic process, I might have a better answer for you. But the, the truth is that um, maybe out of sheer luck or happenstance or maybe uh, as a side effect of how the uh, Constitutional Council was selected, um, the people who were there we're very mindful of not being caught into the, the political madness of the day or, uh, or anything like that. And the biggest accusation from the right wing um, in the newspapers was that, that the constitutional process was a reactionary document, you know, wasn't, uh, was producing a reactionary document. And I guess that just that, that ass, uh, assertion or that, uh, that accusation was in a certain way a, a certain uh, push against, you know, to make sure that that didn't happen. But it's hard. Yeah, there's um, a bit of irony here that uh, the British government have written 50, over 50 constitutions for other countries since the Second World War. Mm, yes. Um, and also that um, you said 50,000 people. There's a 
you count all of the members of political parties in Scotland, it only measures just over 50,000. Mm. So if you get 50,000 and one, um, you've got more members than they have, you can speak with more authority. Okay. Well, I mean, that might be a good reason to pick a number like 100,000. Uh, you've got to have uh, moral authority, right? But yeah, the British are incredibly good at writing constitutions. It's a shame they haven't done it for themselves. Uh, yeah. Good. Yeah. One of the one of the things that's never been discussed in the independence debate so far is the nature of the relationship of the constitution towards the head of state. I love this. I like the fact it's not been discussed yet because the constitution process will come after a yes vote. And in that constitutional process, you'll have to decide, because the draft constitutions have already said it would be Her Majesty's lineage. Right. That's when we make our move for a republic. And I like the fact, <laughs> <laughs> I like, I like the fact that it's not discussed in this, as, as many of us are Republicans and that, but that's when we'll make a move for a republic. Yeah. After a yes vote, we'll go for a constitution. Just in case you want. Yeah. That, that, would, that would arise inevitably anyway in the discussions of a constitution. But, but even within the scope of, of uh, continuation of the mon monarchic rule, um, Canada has a constitution, New Zealand has a constitution, Australia has one. You know, uh, that, that is a problem that has been solved. So uh, essentially, you know, every argument that has been made against Scottish independence is nonsense. You know, just... Uh, uh, you should probably make a list of all of the arguments. There aren't that many. And then just you know, write a, a three-word refutation. Uh, you are wrong might be a good start. But um, yeah. <laughs> Anything else? One more briefly, if that may. From your observation of Scottish politics, would you say that the question of the Scottish Constitution will have any life whatsoever after a no vote? Oh, that's a hard one. I guess it depends on the margins. Um, but it would be very interesting, so as much as I hope that you don't have a no, uh, that if there were a no, then that people say, well, okay, we can't have independence, but can we please have a constitution? That would be, and, and that might even strengthen the position of the, the Scottish Parliament and. Uh, and kind of the separation. I mean, that's essentially what happened in Iceland in 1884. And yeah, it only took uh, 60 th years thereafter to get independence. <laughs> yeah, there's one at the back. Yeah. I think we'll be here, Peter. No. I'll do one, guys. I just wondered if you were doing it all over again, what would you do differently? Um, work faster. Uh, be more aggressive against those who were kind of naysayers against the process and uh, and be more well be less naive as to the ability of uh, of those who really don't want things to change to destroy everything for everybody else I think that's the main thing um, but I'd also like to actually make it into the Constitutional Council next time <laughs> 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 no, I, yeah, I, I, well, yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not very good at being a politician, but uh, I, I'm, I'm fairly functional at being a geek, and uh, uh, I, the saying is everybody needs a hacker, right? Um, but uh, there is some, you know, I think it's kind of a part of the legacy of the United States that, you know, they, they venerate their founding fathers so, so highly that, you know, kind of being the guy who writes the Constitution is something everybody should really want to be in their country, right? So, <laughs> I'm not without ambition. The way the Constitution is written by quite a few Scots, uh, as you tell me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's good. All right. Um, if there's any other questions, feel free to grab me either here or I'm going to be downstairs at the um, uh, Bella Caledonia um, launch. So, thank you very much for listening. <laughs> <laughs>